This morning has been a revelation for me. I never thought I would be in the same room as an avid QR code user. <laughs> Good work. And the, I guess the second one is chips in your clothing, which let you know how regularly they've been washed. My mum is going to kick my ass when she gets that data. <laughs> Um, okay, enough of this. Um, IoT. So we, we talk about IoT at the London College of Fashion, but probably in slightly different terms. We talk about the IOB, the Internet of Bodies. Um, I guess the projects that we're working towards are about connecting our clothing, how our clothing will connect to people, places and spaces. Um, so I head up the Fashion Innovation Agency. Um, and we are a not-for-profit creative agency based at the London College of Fashion, funded by the European Union to help stimulate the London designer economy. Um, I guess we are the bridge between the design industry, fashion design industry and wider industry. We do a lot of projects with retailers, but we've become most known for our technology projects. Um, so I'll talk you through some of those projects and show you kind of the direction that we've been going in over the past couple of years. Um, so as I mentioned, we are at LCF and we have a digital studio at the college which specializes in 3D printing and a really nice example of how big brands are beginning to engage with fashion designers to create some kind of technology project to help really boost their marketing and sell products. This is a project that we did two and a half years ago with Absolute Vodka. Um, Absolute wanted to work with Gareth Pugh, really big designer. Um, so Gareth designed that collar uh, for Absolute and we 3D printed it at the college, stuck it on 75 bottles for Absolute and they put it into Harvey Nichols and Selfridges and it sold out in a day. So brands are beginning to think about Hmm, there's some technology, we don't really know how to apply it. We can use fashion to make it more credible and ultimately help boost our sales. This is a big project that we did for Nokia in February uh, of last year at London Fashion Week. And Nokia came to me and said, Matt, we want to do something at Fashion Week. We have no idea what we want to do. Your brief is be disruptive. And so I went away and was really disruptive and uh, threw, threw them lots of ideas and they said, eh, kind of disruptive, not so disruptive. And eventually we got to an idea where I sketched that skirt in the office. The team laughed and said, that's horrid. Um, <laughs> there's no way they're going to go for that. Um, so I took it to Nokia and they kind of liked it. So we, um, we built it. And it became known as the world's first digital skirt. It was made up of the Nokia 1020 and 1520 phones. So the top two layers of the 1020 and the bottom of 1520. Um, it, um, it went down the catwalk on a fairly high profile model and generated absolutely enormous PR interest. So 5% of all London Fashion Week tweets were about that skirt. Um, Nokia tracked the PR coverage, and I think just in the, the five days of London Fashion Week, it generated over 1.4 million euros of tracked PR coverage and was still being featured on TV in December. I think BBC Click and Sky News featured it in their technology, uh, fashion technology roundup of the year. Um, but more importantly for Nokia, they measure brand sentiment and um, that skirt shifted their brand sentiment by 2%, which when you're competing with Samsung and Apple is kind of a big deal. So I took that into Microsoft. Just a few days later, Microsoft bought Nokia uh, and the board looked at the numbers and said, this is astonishing. How much did you spend? $2 million? I kind of went, oh, are you kidding me? $2 million? Yeah, next time, $2 million. Um, it, look, it's not wearable technology. It weighs 25 kilograms. It's not the kind of thing you're... There's huge straps under there. You kind of want, hi, honey, where are you? Uh, yeah, just at the supermarket. Um, but what it was, a really good example of, of fashion designers working much more closely 
uh, with technology companies. And I've got an image of another digital skirt, which I'll show you in a minute, which is a bit different. So bear that one, embed that in your memory, and we'll talk about digital skirts a little bit later. So as I said, we're, Microsoft were kind of happy with what happened, and so asked us to do a little bit more work, this time around Menswear Week, which was in June of last year. Um, and so we took their um, inductive wireless chargers and built them into a pair of trousers. And hey presto, you have the world's first wireless charging trousers. Um, this was featured on the catwalk um, of Adrian Sauvage, uh, a menswear designer who genuinely is friends with Tiny Temper and George Lamb, which is a nice boost for the PR. Um, and I guess what was interesting about this project was that um, we actually sold them. Um, we, um, we put them on Amazon's wearable tech platform. I, they're about 900 quid, and I think we sold maybe two pairs. But it, it was a real example of taking a product, building in wireless, so when you pop your phone into your trouser pocket, it charges. Um, then we did a bit of experiential stuff with Microsoft about how technology can enhance a catwalk experience. So we just built a massive four-metre pyramid, live streamed from their Lumia phones, and then used real-time CGI to kind of rip the models apart, just, just because we wanted to. And then so, uh, I think Tom mentioned the zoo belt. So I was speaking at a wearables conference at the back end of last year, uh, and the team from Zoo, or Nifty, came up to me and said, Whoa, this is great. Um, we've got a flexible battery, we want to make a belt. And they showed me their prototype. And I said, guys, Jesus, let me help. Um, and so we partnered them with some, um, uh, with some menswear designers. And this actually went on the catwalk in January of this year in London Collections. And um, just prior to that, it was, um, we put it on Indiegogo. And I think in 10 days, it raised $75,000. So you know, it's a simple way to charge your phone. Um, it's great design, it looks good, it solves a simple problem. You know, that's, that's a good wearable. Um, but there are some massive issues with fashion engaging with technology and wearables. Um, probably the most <laughs> obvious example is that. <laughs> what is that? Um, you know, don't take a product and just put it on the catwalk and expect that that makes it fashionable. It doesn't. And, you know, that's a very well documented example. Um, I mentioned digital skirts. So everyone remembers my beautiful Nokia skirt. <gasps> oh, what is that? <laughs> what is that? This is real. Um, this was in September of last year at New York Fashion Week. The designer is Ely Tahari, real credible designer. Um, and you know, the press release said this is the intersection of fashion and technology. It's a skirt. Seriously, are you for real? So I think there are some issues with fashion engaging with technology. Um, there's a lot of money being thrown at the catwalk by brands wanting to engage. Do it properly, please, or don't do it at all. So um, um, what can we do? Um, we do an awful lot of work with the Walt Disney Company. Uh, and they have amazing content for us to play with. So in September of last year, we engaged on a really exciting project uh, based around Tinkerbell. Uh, and I was talking to the guys at Disney and said, well, hey, look, we could do a pixie dust dress. And they went, what? Um, I said, bear with me. It, it's, it will be good. Um, and I guess our thinking behind that was to move the wearable discussion on a bit. Everything was device focused, functionality focused. And what we wanted to demonstrate was that for real, if you really want the fashion audience to engage, it has to be first and foremost beautiful. So that's the designer that we worked with, Richard Nickel. Um, and we worked with a company called Studio XO um, to help us build it. And we made a pixie dust dress from fiber optic material, really simple. And that's Richard looking at the fiber optic ma material thinking, Matt, what the hell have you got me into? We're going to make a dress out of that? Um, so we did. We actually had Richard's pattern cutters working alongside Studio XO. Um, technologists, pattern cutters, same room. 
and they made a really nice slip dress. That's all it was, just a very simple slip dress. Um, the timeline on it was fairly tight. We did it in 10 days. Um, and it went on Richard's catwalk show in September of last year. And that's what she looked like when she went down the catwalk. Um, it's just fiber optic material, uh, one high intensity LED, so we overpowered the LED to get it really hot so you get that shimmering effect. And I guess created something of a media sensation. We had, uh, on the day of release, 127 million impressions. Um, during Fashion Week, 210 million impressions. Forbes said that this is the first example of truly beautiful wearable technology. And I guess it's become a bit of a benchmark for what brands have to achieve. So yeah, that's what Forbes said, the independent. And I love Tatlers. They're fainting over the opening look at Richard Nickel. But it was great. Um, so that's what we do. And we've got just a little short video on Tink and how we made it happen. So if you want to play that. approached by Richard Nicholl to create the Pixie Dust Dress, which was very, very, very exciting. His brief was, how do we take Tinkerbell into the 21st century? I've taken a kind of nostalgic appeal from Tinkerbell in that she used to wear a sweet hat neckline and draw in parallels with the 90s slip dress trend, and more specifically, Kate Moss. Of course, you wanted a very magical colour. So we've had to engineer using our specialist uh, magical fabric techniques to create a very, very, very subtle green inspired by Tinkerbell. In our lab, we're a little bit punk rock. You know, we're doing alternate things with technology and I think that that comes through, it's very evident in, in the work that we've created. It's sort of classically beautiful and fragile at the same time. It's the last minute preparations for the show next door, so why don't you come and have a look? We're just really, really excited now to see how the British fashion industry and beyond responds. This collection is very much about marrying the past with the future, so it was a really interesting process um, and one that I'm really thankful for. They're, they're really easy to work with and, and I, it just made me think that their possibilities are kind of endless for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Matthew, or at DrinkMat, <sighs> which is a great Twitter name. Follow me on Twitter, I need Follow you on Twitter. Um, <laughs> that's astonishing. Um, uh, really, really innovative stuff, really exciting stuff there. Uh, yeah. My, my uh, chicken pox, as of last night, ridden daughter, completely into Tinkerbell, loves all the, uh, all the films and stuff. I think she probably will want that dress as soon as she sees it. And that kind of leads on to my question, you know, where we're talking about bridging the gap between technology and fashion. We see stuff on the catwalk and then inevitably there's, th there's a pull or a push mm -hmm. towards the consumer and we start seeing that in the high street stores. Yeah. yeah, we're not seeing this in the high street stores yet. Is it because this is a bit too cutting edge? Is it a bit too expensive? Is it a bit too niche? Or can you see this kind of stuff working its way to something my daughter will be able to buy in three or four years time? Um, manufacturing is certainly an issue, yep. and that's where we're working really hard. Uh, will, you, will your daughter be able to wear this in three or four years? I kind of hope that in three or four months she might be able to. How much is it going to cost me, though? <laughs> it won't be hugely expensive. Okay. <laughs> it won't be hugely expensive. Okay, I'll, I'll digest that. Come um, back to me when, uh, when I show you the price. <laughs> <laughs> um, any questions for Matt, please, ladies and gentlemen? Yes, at the front here, Sophie. 
Um, hi, Alex. Um, thanks hi. for the very interesting work that you've just shown. Um, is this fiber optic fabric? Yeah. It's a bit of material. Is that woven yeah. inside a yeah. fabric? Yeah. Basically, yeah, that's yeah, it. Yeah, it's really it's pretty old. innovative. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thanks, sir. Terrific. Uh, if we've no more questions, we do have a we do have a question. Are you allowed to question? You've already had your time. <laughs> fire away, fire away. Yeah, um, I, I don't actually know. You, you probably touched on it um, in your speech, so I was actually out, outside. Um, in, in terms of designing, I mean, we're similar space, but when, when it comes to designing um, or, or the, the crossover between the two worlds of fashion and technology, mm -hmm. um, one of the big problems that we face, certainly, is, um, is trying to sit in the same room with an engineer and a fashion designer. Um, they drive each other nuts, and every pretty much every meeting ends up in someone shouting at someone else, uh, because the engineering world is so uh, objective and it's so um, locked down, and it's either yes or no, whereas the design world is so subjective. How do you see those two worlds um, really merging together in a kind of a, a collaborative way going forward? It's a great question, Tom. Thank you. Yeah, it's it, without question, it's an issue. Um, none of those projects were easy to pull together. Um, yeah, particularly thinking about the Nokia project was a massive challenge. Um, it's almost like there's a new industry awaiting to be built. You've got fashion designers, you've got technology, you've got all of the engineers on the other side, and this massive gap in the middle. And I think it's something at the college that we're beginning to look at. There's this third space that we need to fill very quickly if we're genuinely going to move things forward. Mm. Well, excellent. Um, thank you so much for sharing that with us. I do genuinely hope, and as it seems to be part of your, your remit at, at the agency, is that in a similar way to fashion, stuff that we see on the catwalk inspires other people and filters down to the high street. I really hope that the, your work will inspire people in this room and other people who've seen the work as well, which, yeah. by the sounds of the numbers, is quite a lot of people. There's huge interest, so yeah. Quite a lot. Um, but for now, ladies and gentlemen, please thank give you. it up for Matthew Drinkwater. <laughs>